What's going on everyone? Thank you so much for watching this uh, video. I have with me Dennis Milinchuk and uh, he's hey, a missionary man. overseas. Hey, I am guys. excited to have you, bro. It's good to be here. I'm psyched. I'm, it's, <laughs> it's an honor. It's a privilege. Thank you. Thank man. you. Um, today I wanted to do a video on talking about the church. Um, uh, both of us are really passionate about the true church of, of the living uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, of course, we do things differently because I live here in the U.S., and you're always traveling, you're only here for a week. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, about like what you do overseas, and uh, just kind of how, maybe in, I don't know, a couple minutes, what how you came to the Lord. Yeah, for me, I've uh, my ministry has changed in the last few years. Yeah. When I got out of ministry school, I immediately got into what I would call itinerant missions. Mm -hmm. So it would be short-term trips, we would go from one place to another, yeah. and just partnering with local ministries, local churches, and... So for the first first year or so of doing ministry, I'm like traveling, speaking at churches. Mm -hmm. That whole time, I'm, I started getting very discontent inside my heart because, you know, you are seeing the Lord touch people, lives being transformed and, and being touched. But really, actually, what, what I was hungry for, it was seeing the actual result of that transformation. So I knew mm -hmm. for me, I wanted to get my get myself plugged in somewhere, get my yeah. feet rooted somewhere. And so we went to China, uh, went to China got all my things i mean i i gave all my all my stuff away put, packed everything up in two bags and into a backpack and yeah uh went to nepal for 41 days and then from from there went straight to china didn't know where i was going to move to there was one city that i felt the lord was leading me to go to but that wasn't certain i just moved i just went with all my yeah. stuff and showed up and they knew i was coming but we had our meetings that i went to another city and after prayer and we we, we really pressed in we felt it was con confirmed yeah. moved there now we're i'm staying there helping with uh it's a foster home that rescues special needs kids out of uh, some really tough situations, some of the orphanages. I mean, it's just, it's awesome. And we're seeing God touch people's lives through this holistic effort. It's its wonderful. So I'm guessing you already know how to speak. Um, what's the language again? Mandarin. Mandarin. I, I, I got to make sure that I pronounce it correctly because I always <laughs> used to say Mandarin. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, but like if anybody here actually listens, they, I probably have a big accent and I'm learning, I'm studying, I'm starting to speak, I'm understanding wow. much more. Do you see yourself actually doing this for the rest of your life? Like um, if, you know, for me, missions is always a full life on call, mm -hmm. um, but the context can change at any moment. Um, I do feel like the Lord has given me a specific, um, at least a, a minimum time of yeah. being in China. Oops. Being in, <laughs> being, being in, um, uh, in, in that part of the world. But I do think that there's going to come a time where I'm going to different places yeah. and doing stuff, you know. Makes total sense. By the way, if you are wondering where I got these cups, um, so a friend of mine decided that we should have them on podcast and, uh, they, uh, they branded them with uh, In Light of Eternity. Um, so with that said, um, this whole purpose of this show that I'm doing is I want to kind of put an emphasis on people that live in light of eternity. Um, and when I look at your life, man, just leaving everything behind, right, and just kind of go in there and uh, be it South, Af South Africa, um, be it Ukraine, because you've been so many different yeah, different places. Colombia. Colombia, yeah. Um, I, I just, for the last five years, I think, close to five years, four, mm, four about, five years. Yeah. I've, well, I've been doing on and off. I've been full time for about three years. Yeah. Yeah. That's some dedication, you know? And, uh, so, so uh, let me ask you this, why would you leave everything behind and why would you kind of like abandon everything mm. and move to a country that you don't even speak the language? Yeah. You don't really, I remember one time you called me from Africa and you're like, Bro, like my passport was stolen and uh, I have no money and I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was stolen. So, Everything was gone. Like, <laughs> that was crazy. Had no money, had no, my computer was gone, oh my, you know. So my question is, why would any rational sane person do that to themselves? That's a great question. <laughs> Honestly, the, the honest answer is, I remember when I first fell in love with yeah. Jesus and I remember... 
the word of God became so dear to me. I just, I would go through the pages and I would just be like, what is Jesus saying? Yeah. What is Jesus saying? What am I supposed to, what is this supposed to look like? What am mm-hmm. I supposed to do? And I would read certain passages that many times are referred as the difficult passages. Right. And I, and I always thought, this is, what do you mean difficult? This is, this is the gospel. This, this, this is, it's all in or nothing. Yeah. I, what does it look like? And for me, as I begin to pray, say, God, whatever it takes, I want to live, I want to live this. And so when Jesus would say, you know, um, you know, abandon everything, sell everything you have, give to the poor and follow me, you'll have riches in heaven, you know, and, um, you know, foxes have, uh, have holes, birds have nests, but the son yeah. of man has nowhere to lay his head. And like, Jesus, you live a certain kind of lifestyle. There was a certain abandonment. I, I want to do whatever it takes. And so for me, as I prayed, I begin to have a burden for the poor, for the, for, yeah. for the, uh, for the forgotten, for the disenfranchised, for those who have been taken advantage of and for the nations. And so, I started to go out on short-term trips and little by little, for me, long-term missions wasn't a thing. I thought I'd be doing big, massive crusades. But when I began to meet with the people, I realized these are the ones that Jesus gave his life up for. I want, I want to get... The poor and the forsaken. The forsaken, the, but also the individuals. Because I think almost any person wants to have that great reward of saying, man, I'm standing before thousands of hundreds of thousands of people and preaching the gospel and hundreds and thousands of them being saved. Yeah. But, but I said, God, like, what is most dear in value to you? You know, what, what, what do you, what do you say is of most importance? And I, and I realized it's, it's the one. The, mm-hmm. the, the thousands and the millions are comprised of the one. And, and I started to hear missionaries speak and share that same heart. And I said, Lord, I believe that this is what you value is a life laid down, not just for the, for the, for masses. the big masses, but for that individual. Yeah. And so whatever it looks, and for me, I just knew it was missions. And so I I just set out to pursue that. You know, as a pastor, I encounter this a lot where you get so overwhelmed, right? Like there's so many people in the world that you're trying to reach and you're like, how are we going to get to everyone, right? Um, And I remember this story about some kid that was walking on the the shore and um, this grandpa of his was taking some of the fish that was kind of washed ashore and it was still alive and to throw back into the back into the ocean. Right. So the kid's like, well, why Why would you, what's the difference? I mean, there's like thousands of them on, on the shore. And he says, well, for this one, and picks up one of the fish, it makes all the difference. Right. You yeah. know? Yeah. And, and I think the approach that we should take as um, followers of Jesus is that, you know, you might not make a difference in the sense that when it, when we talk about scale, but for the person that you are reaching, it makes all the difference. Right. You know, and it's so crazy because a lot of times, I think even myself, you get so, it's easy to give your life to the thousands and the masses, but, you know, to just kind of give it for one person to mm-hmm. say, hey, uh, that's a whole different thing. And when I look at your ministry, man, how you left everything just to kind of go into a, a village that nobody, I don't even know what the village is, where, where how you pronounce it. Um, but uh, I'm really took inspired me a, a by that. a year to learn how to pronounce it myself. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it took you a year to pronounce it. Um, but here's some questions that I had for you. What What's some of the differences that you see between the modern day church here and the Western culture? Or um, namely, I'm in Seattle, well, we're in Bellevue, mm-hmm. next to Seattle right now. Um, and we're just in the United States, you know, like it's it's a gospel of, Hey, you know, God can do everything for you. God has great plans, you know, and, and a lot of it is mixed with psychology and prosperity gospel and, you know, civil rights gospel. And you have all these gospels, which in, in my own opinion, I think that gospel is the gospel. It's not all these other things that we mm-hmm. add onto it. So what are some differences that you see between the church here and the church, whatever you are preaching overseas? Uh, well, it's this it's a difficult question to answer right? mm-hmm. straightforwardly just because even in the states uh the, the demographic is so different depending on where you go and every right, church is right, different right, depending yeah. on you know how the culture that's being instilled there um one thing that you I would would notice that I, I could talk about mm-hmm. is just a difference in how services are done and gotcha some of the um some of the ways that that services are facilitated. One thing I want to say is straight up forward, and I know this is your heart, but just for the yeah. sake of people listening to us, man, I love the Church of Jesus Christ mm. in all of her beauty and all of her ugliness, all alike. I love the body of Jesus yeah. because this is whether I like whether we like it or not. This is who we are. This, yeah. this is we what God what we are what God paid for. You know, yeah. and so in the middle of all of the things we got to figure out, God loves us, and we got to work for absolutely. Yeah. And the the thing that I've that, that I have seen though that is a, mm-hmm. one of the differences is that um, there is a there's a certain uh, 
stage-like kind of presence mm-hmm. that uh, a lot of Western Christianity has. And I think that has a lot to do with culture and trying to reach out to the crowds and be attractive. But one of the things that I have seen that is different in, in right. some of the churches Overseas. is that there's there's definitely this this sense of value of holiness under the Lord, of, mm-hmm. of, pre- of of valuing the presence of God in a meeting where we're coming. Not you know there's no there's no big speaker name. It's just we're here because we're assembled to to meet with would Jesus. Would you would you say that the church here is more about coming to spectate or to see something, and then over overseas is more about participating? That everyone comes and says, "Hey, is this?" Because this is kind of like the vibe that I'm getting. Um, that a lot of times, the way we structure church here is that, "Hey, you know, come and watch the stage. What's happening on stage?" I, I'm actually, I've never said this, but like, I, I kind of wonder what would it look like if our, like, let's say you have a a building, and instead of having a stage, everyone's sitting in the circle, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> and uh, people are hey. praying together, like, hey, yeah. and everyone is bringing something to the table right and, and is is um you know if it's if it's a word if it's a song if it's a prophecy if it's whatever it is you know but i feel that a lot of time in the western culture church like atmosphere is we come to spectate or to see something rather than to participate mm-hmm. you know so how do you see that i mean is that something that you would agree with or do you mm-hmm. feel uh, differently about it. Well, I, w- I would have to answer him with a l- l- little mm-hmm. bit of a cultural context because mm-hmm. in America, there's a certain culture where Amer- with, there's been a lot of evangelism that has been done for the last few hundred years here, right? right? And so there's this very sense, this, this sense of familiarity with the gospel and, so, and church has become a place where people can come mm-hmm. to meet with God for the first time. And so there's been this way of trying to um, get to mm-hmm. get this crowd that is seeking the Lord, get them to to see who we really are and yeah. be, be attractive to say, hey, we're, we this life is good and we want you to, to know that. Um, in a lot of other contexts, in a lot of different cultures, Christianity is looked down on. So to be part of a congregation, it's actually... Um, not a cool thing it's to not a, It's not a cool thing. So yeah. it, or, or it's not very easy. It's not very convenient. So um, the people that come there, they're, they're there and they're, they're not trying to appeal to... Mm-hmm. As much as they really want to connect with one another, with the Lord, to right. be encouraged with one another as the body of Christ and filled up in the Lord. But now, I do have to say this. this I have been in churches in America that have oh, an amazing hunger for God. And I definitely don't want to come up and say all of all of this is like that everywhere. Yeah. Even, for the, even for countries that are in third world nations, the, the, any kind of dynamic could be like that. Uh, where it's just, it really depends on who, who the what the heart is in the meeting, what, mm-hmm. what the what the what the passion is of the people, and uh, so yeah. So then my next question I I want to ask you because I feel um, very strongly about this. Um, I do think a lot of time we would like to think that we preach Jesus, um, but I think even when. In the context where I do church, uh, a lot of time um, we kind of have Jesus as an add-on, yeah. not as the answer to all of our problems, as the comforter to all of our you know distress. Um, but it's more like, well, just add Jesus in your mix, and you know there, you know there could be more. You know, have Jesus. You know, which I think the whole purpose of everything that we do is preaching Jesus. And having Jesus the center of everything. I, I even disagree with the idea that put God first. Because I feel a lot of time, you know, we say, okay, well, I'm going to give God half an hour in the morning because I put him first. But then I'll live the way I want. And I, I think I agree more with the idea of having God at the center of everything that we do. Be it like worship, be it washing the dishes, or being working. He has to be the center of every single conversation that I have with mm. anyone uh, from the CEO to the um, you know custodian, you know what I mean. Uh, so I, I do believe that as a church here in the U.S., we got to do more to preach Jesus, yeah. to make sure that Jesus is the climax of our sermons, yeah. you know, yeah. and He is the answer to the problem, not self help or religion yeah. or. So we're, 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 how is that different from the places that you are doing ministry? Well, I, I just think the gospel does not make sense if Jesus is not everything. It just does. There's there's no power. There's, yeah. It, it does. I mean, there's nothing to it. I have nothing to gain 
from the gospel unless Jesus becomes all in all. Yeah. And so even that idea of, you know, God first and then family second and then, you know, mm-hmm. this third, fourth. I, I also don't really like that because for me, it's God is all in all. Yeah. God is in place number one, place number two, place number three. Mm-hmm. And of course, there is priority structures that we can place in. But ultimately, Absolutely, everything yeah. you do, let it be done as unto the Lord, mm-hmm. you know. And so there has to be a place where our lives are consumed by God, where reality and honestly at this this place where you, we have to understand that everything came forth from god for god came from god for him so if our reality makes sense without jesus then we have to re- really look at our lives and say there's something missing because mm-hmm. if life came from god and it's yeah. for god reality to me does not make sense like at, th- at this point it's just there's there's no there's no meaning there's no substance there's nothing if Jesus is not everything there's no point to anything that we're doing if he's not the cru- the the crux of it all the mm-hmm. the reason where it's all flow- everything is flowing out of him flowing back into you know and that's where we find the most joy and contentment mm-hmm. you know the whole sacrificing everything unto the lord um it, 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 we can talk about it as being sacrificed but really in the end I'm gaining much more than I'm giving up yeah you know and I think if we over if we if we if we over uh, exaggerate, not even exaggerate, but overemphasize the sacrifice over the gain of the reward of knowing Him, mm-hmm. I mean, we're really, we're really, our perspective needs to shift a little bit because what I'm gaining it's actually an honor to get. I mean, it's an honor to get rid of everything else for yeah. the sake of what I'm getting. It's like that Apostle man, Paul, Apostle Paul, Paul talk as, the yeah. parable of the the man who found the merchant, uh, the, the merchant who found the the, price, uh, the pearl of great price, sold, sold everything, everything he had, yeah. found the great pearl, right? Yeah, so and the, yeah, yeah, and then the Apostle Paul says that like I, you know, I gave up everything where I considered everything as loss, you know, for the knowledge of knowing Christ, um, and that kind of brings me onto the next thing. And I think one of the reasons that we downplay, if I could even use that word, Jesus, is because I don't think we make a big deal out of sin, and and because we're not making a big deal out of sin, because sin is a big deal. For example, if we preach Jesus's payment for our sin but if we think the sin is nothing then what jesus has done is not a big deal so i think there's a movement now towards like well you know not everything is horrible like you know not everything is not every single thing that we do um let me let me think about this how how to put this in perspective um i feel for the most part the church are large we don't take sin seriously enough. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we realize how much sin destroys our lives. Yeah. And because we downplay sin in our lives, then there's no true, you know, deliverance from it. You know, yeah. uh, so I, I do believe that for us to preach Jesus, as Jesus is the answer to everything, we have to kind of like understand that yeah, Jesus, I think the cross is where Jesus showed us how much he loves us, but also the cross shows us how bad our sin is. That he took the sacrifice of God, or he took the Son of God to die for our sin. So uh, I, I hope that we go back to talking about these things. Like, I hope that we go back. But my question to you is, is that something, is the church overseas kind of like ignoring the problem of sin too? It, are they just kind of saying, you know, no matter who you are, what, whoever you are, whatever you did, it's fine. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares about you, which, of course, he loves you. But at the same time, he loves you enough not to leave you the way you are. Mm. I think a lot of times I've found that uh, the converts or people who have come to believe in Christ mm-hmm. in these these other countries, especially restricted nations, closed nations, right? they you will very rarely find a false convert Mm -hmm. just because the stakes are so high. The stakes are high. There's a lot more sacrifice, a lot more family um, pressure and uh, persecution from your own family Mm -hmm. that's involved um, from being disowned and so on that you don't just call yourself a Christian because it's a, it's a good idea or because you like the ring of it. It's you mean it. And of course, 
you would always find, I mean, I from you would find that people when they have given up their lives, they the what what continues to encourage them to go forward is because they say, you know, I found something so much better, and it's the relationship with the Lord. I think that many people don't have a value mm -hmm. for holiness um, because they don't have a value for relationship. The goodness yeah. of of right relationship with God is what prompts me to not just get rid of sin, but of anything in my life that dulls my heart towards God. Mm -hmm. You know, because for me, you can get, we can get really relative and interpret different things about what is sin, what is not sin. Everybody can have their own different interpretations based on what they how they think morality right. is measured. But ultimately, it's not just uh, we're not following a law book anymore at this point. Christ went way beyond the law book. Mm -hmm. he, he drew us into relationship. And so our lives are called to do whatever it takes to draw near to God. Yeah. And and I think that 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 is the message. It's the sin. Yes, we need to preach sin. But I think it's even even sin. Uh, the, the power of righteousness is found in that we have found relationship with God. And anything that hinders that needs to get rid of because he's so much better. Yeah. And, and, and the cost of what, like you said, what it took for him for God himself to get that relationship with us was so high. We see how sin destroys yeah. and so on. But ultimately, you can't you can't tell me to turn away from something just because you say, oh, that's a bad thing to do. I get convinced that it's a bad thing to do when I realize how much it's actually, how much bad it's actually doing in the good that I can have by knowing him. Yeah. So, well, well to kind of, I think my last answer or question was kind of long-winded, but, yeah. but one thing I wanted to kind of maybe put this in perspective more is if I got a ticket, uh, which I actually did, um, don't tell anyone, um, but let's say I went to court and the judge said, well, I forgive you for driving 10 miles over, right? But if there's no law that said that the speed limit is 35, then whatever that judge says, it makes no sense, right? Because if there's no speed limit, there's no way for me ever breaking it. You see what I'm saying? I think a lot of time by getting rid of what the law is, mercy doesn't make any sense. You know, I think when as preachers we preach God loves everybody and God forgives everyone, but we don't talk about, you know, what God's standards are, right? Like if don't we don't talk about what the speed limit is, mm -hmm. don't tell me forgive me because um, I went 10, 10 miles over. How would you even know that if it's 10 miles over, if there's no actual standard of what you should be, right. right? So I feel by not talking about God's standards, we've cheapened, you know, his grace. We've cheapened the answer to, you know, our sin. Or And I do agree that it's not just about sin. It's it's anything, right, that, um, you know, certain things might not be sinful, but they're not very wise. Mm -hmm. You know, certain things are not, um, I think Francis Chan said this, that like, the worst thing in life is to succeed at things that don't matter in light of eternity, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> or another guy said it that like, yeah, that's one of the bit. worst things to do in construction is to climb all the way to the top of the ladder and realize you're on the wrong wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, if we get, you know, to be famous and popular and all those things in this life, but we miss the bigger point, and that is eternity and salvation then have we really accomplished anything? You know, and I think that's why it's so important to to preach and tell people about the, the standards of God, but also show people, you know, the salvation that we have in Jesus. Yeah, um, that's really good. So let's let's move on. A um, few, few things I want to mention. Um, what about this idea that Jesus is coming back? I don't really hear much in our pulpits about Jesus coming back and it's crazy because he, the early church they were eagerly waiting for his appearing yeah. is that something common in the you know overseas church like are they are they eagerly waiting for his return or is it kind of like us where we just don't really think much about it. We think that, you know, YOLO, you only live once, so might as well live to the fullest if you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, it's I think I think it's also that's it's hard to say because I think every church yeah. would have its own mm -hmm. emphasis. Is but I know I could talk personally in my mm -hmm. life. I've actually been convicted to re-examine what what I believe about the second return, and mm -hmm. I and I I, I I I we have to live with the tension. Mm -hmm. Where I think a lot of people have moved away from this idea of Jesus coming back soon because there's been a lot of these 
products that come out or so on or these these news flashes you know 20 20 yk whatever mm-hmm. all these different things that come out see jesus coming at this point i feel like a lot of people have felt that it's a big phony yeah. idea even though they might believe it in theologically um there's not that expectancy this urgency and if you look at paul mm-hmm. you know this man who had great revelation in the lord mm-hmm. he lived with this tension of saying man the night is almost over the day has almost come because mm-hmm. of this put off every evil deed put off every yeah. evil work and I, I have to live with this tension of I'm living in a life that I'm thinking three generations ahead of investing not just into this this little moment of time, but I'm going to live my life with substance in what I do so that it could be sustainable for generations to come. But also knowing that I have to build on a solid foundation, knowing that Jesus can come back any moment yeah. and my work will be tested for what it is. And and so there's this thing of like, I'm thinking about legacy, I'm thinking about generations, but I'm also living with this, this expectation of Jesus is coming in the clouds with fire and glory. And I have to be ready for him. And I have to live knowing that my time is fragile. I have to know how to count the days of my life, to know how to really have wisdom. You know, it says in Psalms, teach me to count the days of my life, yeah. you know, so that I may, have, may gain a heart of wisdom. I have to live like that. Yeah. And I think for me, the, the idea of Jesus, this reality of his coming return, it prompts me to say, God, like, I don't want delayed obedience in my life. I don't want to hold back anything. I don't want to live safe. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything that yeah. compromises that amount of time that I have been given. You know, so that's the that's where we're, we're kind of essence at, yeah. of it. Yeah, awesome. So, Dennis, um, you mentioned about us constantly waiting for, you know, looking forward to his appearance. And I think when I look at my own life, I, I always say that you know I can walk out of my place and or my apartment and get hit by a bus and really see the Lord really quickly. <laughs> so, regardless. Uh, if he comes in, you know, this today or this year or next 10 years, I think, you know, for us, it could be over any minute and we need to be preparing for that. I think that's the whole reason why even kind of like I am so obsessed with this idea of about living a light of eternity, you know. Um, and I hope that as a church, we take this a lot more serious. A few other things that I kind of see in the modern day church that I don't really like um this idea that you know communion is also kind of or baptism is kind of an add-on thing uh, i think baptism and communion are kind of like some of the biggest you know more important things that we are doing in life and a lot of times uh, it, it's weird because at our church we do communion where you know you have those little cups and you open them and there's like a little cracker in there <laughs> And I can never open it. And I'm the one. <laughs> I'm the one that was. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. <laughs> so I'm like on stage trying to open it, and it's just the most frustrating thing ever. <laughs> but of course, we're not. I don't really care about the item itself because obviously the power is not in the item itself. The power is in what Jesus has done on the, qu- mm-hmm. on the cross. But I do believe that a lot of time we kind of make it as an add-on thing, not like, hey, this is a big deal. You know, this is remembering what Jesus has done for us on the cross. It is one of the biggest deals in, in our life. And yeah. the same thing with baptism. I, I've heard people, you know, go and baptize more than once and they rededicate their life over and over. And it's kind of like, okay, y- y- you know, that that's a big deal. Um, so what are, what are these sacraments, uh, if you will, um, kind of like when you guys take communion mm-hmm. or you... You have baptism. What is it like? Yeah. Man, this is one of my favorite things to talk mm-hmm. about, but I think it's also one of the most touchy things to talk mm-hmm. about. Uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Randy Clark, he actually has teaching, and he, he brought this out, and he said, uh, what Christ had given the church and was intended to bring mm-hmm. our great, was to be our greatest point of unity, has become our greatest points of division. Wow. In you find that every single denomination and, and different group in the church mm-hmm. has a different take on communion and on uh, and on baptism. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy how what Christ instituted to bring us together has now separated us so much. And I, I like the word that you use. You said you use the word sacrament, which mm-hmm. is the, the traditional way of uh, speaking of uh, mm-hmm. of the Lord's Supper and of the baptism, the word sacrament talks about grace being in, endowed through mm-hmm. partaking in something. And so a lot of different groups have, and you know this more than I do, you know, different groups have different views on what these elements are and what actually happens. And is it, is it just a symbol or is there something that happens actually, or is there something being imparted or mm-hmm. so on? Mm-hmm. Ultimately, I, I come to a conclusion where it's a mystery. Yeah. And there's a mystery involved, but... 
I believe that I, this is not what I'm convicted of. I really believe this, that this is not just me eating a piece of bread and drinking some juice. It's not just me taking a bath. Mm-hmm. I believe there's something that God is doing. I believe there's a supernatural element that's involved and it's instrumental and it's something that God has given to the church that we can partake and remember him. And so um, what I've found is that communion has been some of my my favorite time of the Lord. Like I, I, when I have a higher view mm-hmm. and a higher value for, for these, uh, for, for what God has given to the church, I can receive much more. For example, when you take the, when you uh, eat, uh, take, take the body and drink the blood, it's like you take your time to chew on his body. You take your time and it's not just like get the service done, you know, put it in. Okay. Right. Let's get the song going. It's, it's like take time to receive and remember and to contemplate of what the Lord has done and what He's actually doing. So, and I and I've I, I've heard stories of missionaries of uh, well, there's one story with John G Lake where the, there's a group of missionaries that he brings together tells them about what's at stake for them to go out into these places to yeah, go yeah. S- share the gospel. They and all they say to him is give us communion and we'll go. He ends up burying most of these men who had dying and given their lives to the Lord. And they knew that they were going into most likely a death sentence. Mm-hmm. And their request was, feed us the Lord's Supper and we'll go. And that was their like final request, you could say. There's this mm-hmm. value that that has. And for me, I, I, I find that too, you know, just you take you take these elements, you can you can receive something, you can be refreshed. And anyway, so for me, it's just, I think as a church, we need to, regardless of what our theological view might be, I believe there's a mystery that we have to hold in tangent and we don't always need to have all the answers. Yeah, I think we're yeah. so fixated on trying to figure it out that we don't get to partake and appreciate and receive everything. That Do you see overseas, like, um, is there, are they just as divided about this or are they like, do they just accept it the way kind of, hey, this is the Lord's communion? Mm. Uh, do you see a difference like that overseas? I would actually say in America, mm-hmm. there is the church is much more open now to different denominations than actually a gotcha. lot of other places. Um, you'll find that in a lot of different parts of the world, there's still a lot of denominational split. And, mm-hmm. um, but at the same time, that's not always like that. Mm-hmm. There's also places where if the church is persecuted, then... The church is the church, mm-hmm. and they get along because they have someone in common, you know. And so, what you're saying is just bring back persecution, and we're all, <laughs> all of us will get along just fine. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I even know how to answer that. <laughs> but it's true, though. I mean, if you think about it, it's like I think we we are so quick to see our differences when we're bored. Uh, but I think when we, because uh, I know even like my parents back in Moldova, we were, we were getting fined in 2001 for baptism, you know. And you'd think, you know, the communist regime was over in like 1989. But like we were still kind of like reaping the consequences of that, of that um, kind of like regime. So what I want to say is that I know that in that time we had so much more unity than we have even today. Um, so... You know how there's there's a line that says that um, the, mor- uh, the the blood of the martyrs is the seed of faith. Mm. Um, so maybe, I mean, I would rather us find you know who we are in Christ in time of prosperity, in time of freedom, not under persecution. But at the same time, man, I think freedom can also be a problem at times where. People take so much freedom in what they do, and instead of using that freedom for serving the Lord, mm-hmm. right, we serve our own purpose, you know. And yeah. and I think in light of eternity is is better that we are going through a difficulty and being closer to the Lord yeah. than having everything and forgetting the Lord, you know. Um, anyways, I don't want to get yeah. Too, no, too I was just track. thinking, yeah. like you're talking yeah. about the light of eternity. I yeah. um I heard a guy in Benny Leifsinger mm-hmm. say. Um, a few years ago, he said, choices are powerful in the midst of many options. Mm-hmm. And in the, even in this generation where there's, you know, it seems like it's a little bit lax on the physical persecution in the right, States. Right. That there's still so much other things that are pulling at mm-hmm. people. And I do believe there's a purification that's happening in the church of those who are deciding to follow hard after Christ in the midst of all these options. With our cell phones, the what is available, what is accessible, all the things that are pulling at our attention, it is 
I believe in this time, I believe the angels in heaven are looking and are realizing the importance and the devotion of followers of Christ who are continuing to stay faithful in the middle of all the vomit of hell. Yeah. You know, yeah. so. <laughs> Bro, it's insane. Like, I remember, um, I've never shared this, but which is a crazy story, but I remember I was 16 years old and I was walking in Kmart at that time. I think Kmart is no longer a business. I don't know. But like <laughs> I was walking in Kmart and this girl like, you know, said, hey, uh, can I have your number? And I'm like, and I'm like so dumbfounded. I'm just like, why? <laughs> you know? And she's like, well, I don't know, maybe sleep together. And I'm just like, wow, did I just get like solicited? Wow. You know, like, and I'm like 16 and she's definitely older than 18, you know? And I'm like, dude. People actually walk up on the street and say that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but now I'm looking at the modern Same. day and there's like pornography on the phones, the, the, such an onslaught yeah. of all this stuff. And yeah, maybe in the back in the day, people actually just solicit or they would have to go to a store. But now it's like, like I said, so many choices, so many things that you could read, watch, you know, and, and in that moment choosing to say i will be walking in holiness and righteousness i'm gonna walk with the lord it's no easy task mm. you know when you have you know people that actively pursue to get you into sin <laughs> you know what i mean where, where the things that you see on on you know on media um so it, it's crazy that you mention it because i do agree that like maybe we don't have physical persecution but the enemy is out, you know, and he has an onslaught of, of tools to use against people who choose to, to live differently, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. a few more questions I want to ask you. Um, sure, man. What about um, this idea that I do believe that a lot of times we kind of like knowingly ignore the fact that there is a spiritual world, right? Like we just sort of live like... This world is everything that I see Christians post on Facebook. They're like, you only have one life. And I'm like, uh-uh, that's not true. <laughs> you only live once. And I'm like, uh-uh, you maybe you only die once. You live on forever. You know, and, and, and this idea that like we completely ignore the spiritual and, and the eternal side of things. And we ignore any kind of teaching on demonic oppression and possession. We a lot of times actively ignore um, the fact that there's an afterlife, right. you know, and well, after this life, rather, right? Like after death and, and, and um, how is, I guess my question is how, what's, what's the difference you see here versus overseas? Are people looking forward towards eternity? Are they walking daily, you know, and, you know, knowing that the demonic world is a reality and some of it has to be you know, cast out, some of it has to be rebuked, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean, and cast out, yeah. and, 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 but I think a lot of times, I meet two kinds of Christians, either they're way too obsessed with the dark, dark world, or Christians that completely ignore the whole issue, right. and all they talk about is self-help, and you know, like, the devil is supposedly some kind of idea, not necessarily an active evil for a force and entity. Right. Well, the answer is really straight. Yeah. There are demons. And they, <laughs> it's like, yes, and they, I agree. And, and, they're, and, they're, and, and the, the spiritual realm is yeah. so active. Mm -hmm. um, in other countries, it's quite easy to spot it because they, they dress up the demons and they bow down to them and they kiss them and offer fruits and they're just little statues. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I on, on my way to the foster home from mm -hmm. the apartment when I lived in the village, I'd walk. And I'm walking down the street and I could spot maybe six, seven shrines on the way, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you're just like, what in the world? Why would anybody even consider that as a god? Mm -hmm. And the, the, the reality of demonic deception is just everywhere. It's just mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, even in culture, the way people do things and the, how they do it, um, it's not even masked. Mm -hmm. It's just very evident. But I've heard people say that, oh... You know, the devil, he does things like that in, uh, uh, he does like, things like that in third world countries, but in America, it's not very much like, like this. It's yeah, just it's yeah. a lot much less demonic. And I, and I think the devil just knows how to hide himself really well. And I think that demons can take different forms. Yeah. And I think that we really need to believe that not only are there demons, but there's angels. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, you know, 
a lot of Christians are afraid to talk about angels because the scripture talks about, you know, the worship of angels. But who's worshiping angels? We're talking about God's messengers, mm -hmm. you know, that are given for carrying out the purposes and the will of God. Yeah. And for me to engage in any kind of deliverance ministry, I need to understand that the army of the Lord is on my side. Mm -hmm. Like when, when the Lord opened the eyes of uh, Elijah, the prophet, right, right, yeah. he opened, he saw there are more that are with us than are with them. Yeah. And so when we, like, when we're walking through the streets, when we're seeing all this demonic stuff going on, these rituals, you know, yeah, it, we just, we just walking, we're just praying in tongues. We just, we're just, you know, we're just blessing people. We got a yeah. big smile on our face. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not depressed. I'm not sad. I, I know God's, God loves these people. And he's, and the only way that they're going to get to know him is if we come in yeah. and we bless. And when we get time to spend time with people, a lot of times it is in deliverance ministry. We break things off and people get freedom. So it's so, it's evident and it's yeah. all around us. And the more that we are aware of it, the better we are equipped to fight with the light and bring God's deliverance yeah. in. So um, two more questions. One of them is this, is that talk a little bit about the cost of following Jesus. I don't think we talk a lot about that. Jesus himself said that, hey, if you follow me, you better count the cost. And I know for you, you've g given up everything. You just flew to a different country. I still think it's a bit crazy, but, you know, um, obviously you're paying that cost. You know, you're paying that price. Um, but we're now willing a lot of us were not willing to do that. I'm not willing to actually fly because I think I'm called here. But regardless, like, I don't know how much of it is I think I'm called here and how much of it is me just making excuses, you know. And I think this is where I have to kind of like go to the Lord and say, God, what, what, what is happening? But I think a lot of times we don't realize that we're still paying a price no matter what, mm -hmm. right? Like we are not okay with paying the price that comes with following Jesus. But I think the cost of not following Jesus is so much greater. So how do you reconcile that? I mean, how did you come to that decision? You're like, you know what, whatever, whatever God has called me to do, I'm going to do. Even though that, you know, like we talked about this, what we can't say and we're not can say on camera because I don't want to get you in trouble. Mm. Right. So obviously, you know, you understand the consequences that you can have from, you know, following Jesus. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm in love with God. I'm in love with Jesus. <laughs> I like it. It's simple. Straightforward. <laughs> I love him, man. I, I, there's a lot of things that I know that have a lot of, like when I come and mm -hmm. visit the States, I see a lot of things that people are pursuing mm -hmm. and, and going after. And, um, and you know, there's this thing like, man, I, I, I've missed out on so much of this, you know, mm -hmm. and don't get to experience some of this stuff. And, and I've, and I've learned to deal with all this stuff, like with loneliness or any kind of thing of feeling like I'm not sure what I'm doing, yeah. you know, with the fact that like, man, I just love God and I know he'll never mislead me. Mm -hmm. And he's so worthy of everything. Yeah. He is so worthy of everything. I, I know that if I will follow him, he'll be faithful to me. Like if I, I know that any, I talked about this last night with, 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 with a group I was sharing and saying any kind of spiritual breakthrough that we have in our life is the result of somebody else's sacrifice. Mm, come on. And and I and I know that because I get because of the reality that life is eternal, mm -hmm. that I will actually I have the opportunity in this life today to consider God worthy and to consider yeah. him faithful to what he says and to say Lord, I will not hold back anything. Mm -hmm. I will, like like if there's anything that I could do again, if there's anything that I could challenge myself to do again a, a different way, it'd be simply trust God more than I did. Hmm. It trust him even more than I was able to at that time in my life. Because I know the more I'm able to trust him, the more I'm able to faithfully give everything to him and follow him. Yeah. And, you know, from even things like one of the biggest things for me was family. You know, mm -hmm. I, my, my, my siblings, you know, there's no, there was no dad in the house when we were um, growing, when up. growing up. And so me and my, my older brother, we kind of had this, assume a, like a almost a parental role in some ways so right. the way that you're I, the man of the family you know yeah. yeah and for me to leave my, my family would be like dennis you're leaving us what are you doing like you're not why, why don't you take care of your neighbors you know kind of this whole thing this whole talk and i understand and i'm like but but god he said he said yeah. you know i'm not out here on my own whim i he told me and and i and i trusted that if i would go and follow god that he would take care of my family and i visit yeah. back now and i see that happening 
you know, and it's amazing that what sometimes feels like is a big sacrifice. Ultimately, God says, man, I had that covered the whole time. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing because if I look at Peter's ministry, Apostle Peter, you know, he was a fisherman and then Jesus calls him and you would think, well, he's leaving his business. What? Like, but when did he catch the most fish? Wasn't it with Jesus? You know, so it's like here you. What if Peter decided, like, no, I don't want to leave my business, you know? They're not catching anything, by the way. <laughs> right? like, um, but, like, by following Jesus, not only his business thrived, but he also became a fisherman of men, you know? Right. So the last question I want to ask you is, how do you practically live? I try to ask everyone this. Yeah. How do you practically live in light of eternity? Obviously, I know uh, what you do overseas, and but what are some of the ways that you, you know, be, if it's if it's studying the Word or if it's, how do you practically live that out every single day? I I think. Well, if if we say if we say practically every day, I make I make time mm -hmm. to meet with God every day, and mm -hmm. I, and I've been better at some points in my life than yeah. I've been at you know than at others. But I've learned that if I will just meet with Him, yeah. make a point, and then also like I just what am I feeding myself on? What am I what am I putting into myself? That's what I'm. That's what I'm becoming. So we, we you know, we got also, also organic movement. Yeah. People eating paleo and whatnot, you know. And, <laughs> you know, we got keto and stuff. And, come on. You know, but like, <laughs> come on. And I'm all for eating healthy and stuff, you know. Um, but the same thing spiritually. What am I eating is what I'm becoming. Spiritually, yeah. And for me as well, on a really practical level, it's also the heart posture. Because, you know, getting into ministry, I, I get started in missions. I sacrificed everything mm -hmm. and gave everything away. At this time in my life, a lot of... This, these resources are starting to come back. You know, I'm starting to, the ministry is growing, it's developing. And I have to put myself in a yeah. position and say, God, if you tell me again, I'll give it all up again. Mm -hmm. If you tell me to leave and go somewhere else, I'll do it. You know, and just not just not just making a single sacrifice to the Lord, but living your life as a living Ooh, sacrifice. sacrifice yeah. And that is actually, uh, because Jesus says, many who are first will be last, many who are last will be first. And I'm like, God, I do not want to be last. I, I want, because, and I, I think that's a great prayer. I don't think God is saying, oh, you pray. Absolutely not. I believe God wants us to pray, God, let me be first in the kingdom. Because what does it mean to be first in the kingdom? It means to be the servant of these. Yeah. It means to be like a child. And when the disciples, I heard, I heard a pastor, yeah. uh, Chris Valton preached on this, and he says, when the disciples asked Jesus, um, who, who will be the greatest? Jesus didn't rebuke them for their desire for greatness. He just redefined them in what the gotcha. definition of greatness yeah, was. Yeah. And I'm like, Lord, teach me that in any moment of life, I do not lose my perspective of what the most important things are. Yeah. In light of eternity, in light of this frail life that I can give everything at any time with my finances, with my ministry, with, with reputation, yeah. with family, you know, like all that stuff. It just, whatever it takes, God. I know that Come. you're worthy. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think the problem with uh, being a living sacrifice is that living things have a tendency to crawl off the altar. You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when, it, when the pressure's turned on and the, and the, the fire's on, um, you have a tendency to say, this hurts. I want, I want off. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, bro, Dennis, thank you so much for That's being on here. Um, for those of you guys who are watching on YouTube, thank you so much for... Uh, spending almost an hour with us and uh, let's keep the conversation going in the comment section below um, also I'm going to put a link to your ministry mm -hmm. um, he literally is supported by whatever people give him and day by day so if God is putting on your heart to 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 help his ministry out that'd be awesome for those of you who are on podcast I'm gonna I'm go ahead and uh, place a link you know um, in the podcast so in, look in the show notes um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dennis, Thanks, for being bro. on here, bro. It's my honor, bro. I'm so happy to be yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you.